action today, we are going to get into calculating the equilibrium concentration of vacancies, a 0D point defect in crystalline materials. So last time we saw that vacancies are where, uh, basically, where we have a site that's normally occupied by an atom in a perfect crystal is now suddenly unoccupied. And this can happen by a number of different ways. So you could force an atom uh, onto the interstitial site, into a dislocation core, like rain boundary or free surface. You could basically... Um, if you shoot radiation into a crystal, you can knock these, you know, atoms off of their kind of initial site and create vacancies. Um, that's kind of a nasty way to create those defects, but there are multiple ways that you can kind of create the defect. Uh, and again, why do defects occur? Why do, why is there an equilibrium concentration of defects at non-zero temperatures? Well, because we know in this expression, one of the ways that we could, de we always want to decrease our gibbs free energy. And one way to do that is to increase our entropy. And we can increase our entropy because we know that entropy is proportional to the number of microstates. So this is the number of microstates, which is the distinct number of ways that we can reconfigure um, and kind of arrange our lattice site. Um, but unfortunately, to do this, we're going to have to increase our enthalpy as well. So we can calculate this equilibrium concentration of vacancies, which is just going to be the number of vacancies in divided by the total number of sites. So this is essentially total number of sites, where capital N is the basically the number of, you know, the crystal number atoms in perfect crystal. That's it. So when we create a vacancy, that's going to take some work. So we are going to increase delta H. That's going to increase our energy. So that is unfavorable. Um, so we have to kind of do work in order to create a vacancy. But that penalty, that energy penalty of creating a vacancy is going to be offset by this enormous increase in our, in the, in our entropic uh, contribution. And we can kind of see this enormous increase if we look at the kind of derivation below. So we know how to calculate our change in delta H. Now we need to figure out what is our change in delta S? And to do that, we're going to use the Boltzmann expression, where our, again, K is our Boltzmann's constant. K is equal to 1.38 times 10 times 23. Oops. Per K. It's also equal to 8.617 times 10 minus 5 EV per K. Um, so let's look at the change in entropy of our kind of crystal, and specifically the change in configurational entropy. Now, there's lots of different types of entropy. There's vibrational entropy, there's configurational, there's conformational, there's translational. Um, but we are going to look at, again, the different the number of different ways we can configure atoms uh, on our lattice site. So that's the key thing we're going to be looking at here. So let's look at the change in entropy. So in our reference state, when we just have a perfect crystal, how many different ways can I reconfigure this configuration distinguishably? These are all the same atoms. They're, you, can't, they're, you can't distinguish or tell the difference. Well. This is just going to have, again, this is our number of microstates. This reference is going to be equal to 1. What about the number of ways I can reconfigure if I instead erase an atom? Well, there's multiple ways now. And actually, this is kind of, again, arranging n number of vacancies on n plus n number of lattice sites. That is just going to be kind of our binomial coefficient. So it's going to be this factorial kind of term. So we now know how to write this. We know how to write delta S. And we can now write out our expression for Gibbs free energy here. Uh, I'm using some math and some help with the, our Stirling's approximation here. You can kind of get, double check that math and go through that derivation. But uh, we can now, we have our expression for Gibbs free energy. But we want to figure out and we want to know what is our equilibrium number, equilibrium concentration of vacancies. Xv is equal to n over n plus n. Well, we need to figure out, okay, what if we want to figure out our equilibrium concentration? We need to take the derivative of this with respect to n set equal to zero. So at any given temperature, what is our equilibrium concentration of vacancies? And we do that. Uh, more math here. Again, I'm not going to kind of bore you with the details, but we finally get this expression right here. And this expression is incredibly powerful because again, concentration of vacancies, you can see here, has this relationship in, in actually it's this exponential relationship with temperature. So as temperature decreases or increases, our concentration of vacancy increases exponentially. And this is this type of dependence, this exponential, this general relationship where you have this exponential minus something, something, uh, usually it's an energy, so some type of energy G. Um, you know, again, 
this is just general, so some type of energy joules per temperature. This is known as an Arrhenius dependence or Arrhenius law or Arrhenius relationship. Um, so this is a very, very important um, type of behavior. And you can kind of see this Arrhenius plot shown here below. Now, uh, this is not the best way that we can uh, kind of show and explain this relationship. Um, quickly, uh, real quick as well, um, for metals, um, or actually, you could usually assume this is true. So the exponential of the delta S of vibration is going to be equal, approximately equal to 1. And the enthalpy of formation for vacancies of metals is going to be 15 to 150, uh, basically, KTs. So we can actually do a little bit of work here to make this a more useful graph um, by basically taking the natural log. So let's look at this expression. So if we know this is approximately 1, we know that basically we're going to get exponential minus delta H F, excuse me, over KT. Now, if I were to plot the log, natural log of this, versus instead of temperature, 1 divided by T, I might get a kind of a cool expression. So if I take the natural log, this expression then becomes exponential, or not, no longer exponential, minus delta H F over KT. So let's see, natural log XV minus delta H F divided by K as a function of our variable, 1 over T. Well, that looks like a linear expression, where we can tell the slope is going to be related to this very important expression right here. So again, if I take the, again, this is the natural log, basically ln. So if I take the natural log XV, I'm going to get an expression minus delta H F divided by K. 1 over t. So the slope, if I plot it in this manner, is going to give me my activation energy. So that's a really, really nice way that you can um, work with these uh, type of Arrhenius relationships. And you could do a very, very similar kind of expression to get the, uh, basically the energy enthalpy of formation uh, for interstitials as well. So it's very, very, this is for self-interstitials. Very, very similar type of relationship here. And you could see, again, Arrhenius relationship. Um, now, Typically, you'll see that the formation that this delta HF for interstitials is going to be larger in general than for vacancies. Why is that? Because if I have an, an add or a kind of periodic lattice here, it's easier, or at least it doesn't introduce as much kind of strain if I just kind of remove an atom, then these atoms can kind of relax back to their positions, as opposed to kind of putting an atom right here, where now I'm pushing out here. So it's going to cost more, it's going to basically require more energy for us to kind of in, uh, introduce these self-interstitials. But that energy is going to change depending on kind of uh, how, how closely packed our structure is. So if we have an atom that is that can exist in simple cubic BCC or FCC, this is going to be the most difficult in order to kind of form a uh, self-interstitial. So that is about it. Uh, next time we're going to get a quickly, a very, very short video into kind of some rules for alloys. Um, and there's lots of different types of zero order defects um, and uh, higher numbers, you know, for non-equilibrium processes for quenching. Again, you could create a lot of these defects for lots of different processes, um, depending on, again, uh, what you're doing. So next time we're going to get into some rules for alloys and then into my favorite topic, programming notation. So I'll see you then. Thanks.